Yeah, hi everyone. So this week I have a bunch of hands-on stuff related to neural network training. So first of all, there was the new PyTorch release, which I want to briefly talk about. And also I saw a really cool article regarding tips for training neural networks. And since I'm currently grading your class projects, I thought it might be a good opportunity to go through some of these tips and tricks for yeah, helping with neural network training. So with that, let me get started with the stuff in the news for this week. Yeah, probably the coolest thing that happened in the context of deep learning this week was that there was a new PyTorch release this week. So I usually, yeah, I really like that if there's a new version uh, that comes out, it's maybe every half a year or so, because yeah, there are usually a lot of cool new features and um, improvements that are useful in practice. And since this class is also focused on PyTorch, I thought it might be worthwhile mentioning some of these new additions. So um, there is an article that they put together with the highlights in this new uh, 1.8 release. So if you're interested, um, this one summarizes most of the relevant changes. A more detailed list listing all the changes and additions is uh, on GitHub. So you can go here if you want the more detailed list, but it's a long list. I think there were about 700 uh, commits, like feature changes or feature additions and things like that. If I were to highlight a few, I have these three as, I would say, my personal highlights. So one is that they now um, yeah, make it easier to use AMD GPUs. So <laughs> competition is always good for business, right? So it's good that also other cards other than NVIDIA are supported, which I think is nice for those people who have, let's say, a gaming PC or something like that with an AMD graphics card. So now you can also use those uh, graphics cards. So this is supported via a library called Rockum. It's like uh, CUDA, but for AMD GPUs. There was support for AMD GPUs before, but it was like a little bit of a hassle. You had to compile PyTorch yourself and it was not so easy. And now what's new is that they are making the binaries directly available from the installer menu. So you can now also yeah, set it up more conveniently. Um, now it's also possible to fit larger models onto GPUs without any external libraries. So recall last week we talked about Fairscale and um, Microsoft DeepSpeed, which were two libraries yeah, providing functions to distribute a model across multiple GPUs. So there were already something like a data parallel in PyTorch. So one is data parallel and one is um, distributed data parallel. Let's just call it DP. And these were methods for splitting mini batches across multiple GPUs and then training in parallel. But this wouldn't help with a problem where a model is too big for a given GPU. One method that we discussed was this checkpointing, but the checkpointing would be using a single GPU. Now there's a way that you can conveniently put a single model onto multiple GPUs and then run it in parallel. I will show you an example. So that's actually pretty cool. So you don't need any external libraries for that. There are now some features that yeah, uh, support it directly in PyTorch. And then also what's kind of nice or what will be nice in practice is that the Torch LinAlc module got extended. Um, or I think in this release it was even created. I was using a pre-release version, so I'm not sure if it was actually created here or just uh, modified. But in any case, so there are now additional yeah, linear algebra functions that are usually only NumPy. So now we don't have to uh, switch so often between NumPy and PyTorch when we train our neural networks if you need something like determinants or eigenvalues and so forth. So that's also making life more convenient. So regarding the um, PyTorch binaries for AMD GPU support, uh, I checked actually the installer menu. So good news is, like I said, it's available now. It does not seem to be available yet though for Mac and Windows only for Linux right now. But I think still this is pretty exciting because I'm pretty sure th these will be also added over time. So it's probably just a matter of time. So things are developing in a nice direction where you can now uh, yeah, directly install um, the wheel via pip for Rockm uh, AMD support if you are on Linux at least. And I'm pretty sure Mac and Windows will probably also follow sometime. Uh, by the way, I updated one of my computers with PyTorch uh, 
um, the other day. And yeah, this uh, I was just uh, looking at this. I was really surprised about the size. It's now 2.48 gigabytes. So it's kind of impressive what's all in that library. So one thing I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that in class, but um, so when you install PyTorch, the GPU or CUDA version, it will bring its own CUDA, which is um, done to make things more convenient. So before that, uh, when I used, uh, I mean, like that was like 2015 and things like that, when I used TensorFlow before uh, CUDA was bundled, you had to yeah install CUDA on your graphics card and then link it when you install it. And that was usually very flaky. It took a lot of yeah, effort to somehow make sure that yeah, the library is using the right CUDA version on your computer. So this way, uh, bundling the installer here with the CUDA version, the CUDA toolkit here, um, makes it a little bit more convenient to install that. So you don't have to manually link the, the PyTorch library with CUDA and QDNN, but that also has the downside that this is rather large. I was just uh, noticing it. Anyways, uh, so regarding the distributed training that I mentioned where you can run multiple or one model on multiple GPUs. So um, there are some yeah, additions that are listed here. There were a few more. So they have the pipeline parallelism that I mentioned last week where yeah, you just put a model on different, um, you use a sequential model and then you put different parts of that model on different GPUs and there's a utility to make that more convenient. I will show you in the next slides how that looks like. We already saw yeah, last week a version using this fair scale. Then there are also for, dis uh, data, uh, for distributed data parallel, there are also some additions um, and also this uh, zero redundancy optimizer making the optimizers more efficient. So last week we also mentioned briefly um, these types of things and they also got added directly to um, yeah, to PyTorch, to the main library. Um, so yeah, here's just a brief overview of this model parallelism using multiple GPUs. It's kind of related to yeah, the pipeline version. So how that works is that you put different parts of a model. So if you split your model into four parts, let's say you have four layers. So here the F represents the forward pass. So let's say you um, run the first layer on GPU, or you keep it on GPU zero, this one on GPU one, GPU two, and GPU three. So this way you avoid exceeding the memory of GPU zero because you have each layer on a different GPU. I mean, for a single uh, or simple multi-layer perceptron, that's probably um, not necessary, but if you later have larger networks, I will show you an example that might make sense. Um, yeah, and so here we, have then one layer per GPU and then F I think is supposed to stand for forward pass and then you, yeah, you have the backward pass similarly. But one downside of this approach is that you can see, so this one runs, it, uh, so the second GPU needs the results from this GPU, right? So then it's kind of GPU zero is keeping or staying idle while GPU one runs and so forth. So in that way, where everything here under the area under the curve here, this is like idle time for some of the GPUs. So in this way you don't utilize three out of the four GPUs and that is basically uh, kind of inefficient because things are sitting there. So one improved version is to use these types of micro batches. So this is like uh, illustrated here. So this already starts running while these finish up basically on different micro batches and then they are passed to the other GPUs. So in that way, you kind of run certain things somewhat in parallel. Of course, there's still this bubble here, what they call bubble, where there is yeah, inefficiency, but this is at least a small improvement over the regular model parallelism. So this is kind, kind of called pipeline execution. I don't know why the word pipeline uh, is used, but it might be because the tool, I think the original one was called a G-pipe, but um, yeah. In any case, if you want to learn more about this, you can visit this link here and that will bring you directly to this website where I got this from. Um, actually, I was kind of curious and wanted to try it in practice yesterday. So I implemented a VGG16 network. It would actually fit onto my uh, onto a single GPU, but just for the sake of the example, I just chose that model because it had different blocks. So I yeah, coded it up in different blocks. And then I was putting it onto 
or into this pipeline here. So what I did is I was writing up these blocks. So this is one block in my model. I have five of these blocks. And one block is uh, one convolutional layer, then a ReLU, another convolutional layer, another ReLU, and the max pooling layer. We will talk more about that in the convolutional network section. But so you can, but the main takeaways you can see here is that there are multiple things in one block. It's it can be pretty large if you have maybe even more channels. This would be, uh, I mean, not really large, too large for a single GPU, but again, it's just for the sake of this example. So at the bottom now, I'm showing you how I use this new pipe in Torch Distributed Pipeline Sync. There are actually a few more setup steps that I'm skipping here because they didn't fit on the slide. But if you're interested in checking out this code that I was, yeah, playing around with. I put it here uh, up on GitHub so you can actually check that out and see the full code and how it looks like. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting the first block on the first GPU. So CUDA 0 is the first GPU. I was actually running something else on GPU 1 so I was skipping it and I was putting things on GPU 2 here, GPU 3 and then the classifier back on to GPU 0. Why did I do that? So one of the reasons is that you have to have the data and the code that you're running on the same GPU. So if you have your input data on GPU 0, you should also have your first block on GPU 0. And then if you have your class labels for computing the accuracy on GPU 0, then you also want to have the output of the model on GPU 0. That is what I was doing here. So I didn't have to rewrite any of my other code. I could just plug that in into my existing code. So then, yeah, I'm using, so I'm, I'm having these uh, blocks now on different GPUs. It has nothing to do with the pipe yet. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm using the sequential in Torch to merge these blocks into one model. And then I'm using just this model inside the pipeline here with eight micro batches. And then I'm providing it here for Adam or to Adam as um, the parameters. And this is essentially it. And then this one would actually then run the pipeline uh, mechanism, like putting it every everything together and work kind of smoothly. And yeah, it worked well in practice. I must say the training time in this case was uh, about half as slow compared to running everything on a single GPU. But again, speed is not the goal here. So no, we are not using this pipeline me mechanism to speed up the model. We are using it because we assume that a, this single model would not fit onto a single GPU. So this way we make possible a training of models that are exceeding a regular GPU memory. So I think this is actually pretty cool and I will pretty surely use that in one of my research projects. Yeah, okay, there was one more modification I had to make to the code. So the modification is in these two lines. So this whole thing is my training for loop over the epochs and over the mini batches. And here I had to add just this line because now the model is not returning the logits, it's returning a R ref reference, a reference object to this RPC thingy. And I, you just had to yeah get the local value and then everything else should work. Again, the full code example is here if you're interested to check uh, check it out. All right, so this was uh, the, just a few highlights from this PyTorch 1.a release. Some other topics. I saw this uh, paper um, on Archive this week, Virus Amnest. So I just thought it might be a cool, uh, new, fun, simple data set for benchmarking yeah, um, deep learning models. So if you are uh, just interested in developing a new model and you want to see how well it performs on different data sets, Amnest is one, Cypher is one. Uh, nowadays also yeah, ImageNet and things like that. So, But I thought this is here a interesting approach because I haven't seen anything like that before. So this is an MNIST-like data set. So if people say something MNIST, they usually mean a data set is approximately 10 classes and 50,000 or 60,000 training images. And here what they have is a data set concerning virus data or malware. So um, there are 10 classes here, so class label 0 and 9. There's only one class that is not malware. It's called binaware. It's like the good stuff here. <laughs> it's just like a regular exa file, I guess. Putty, I think it's um, I think it's a terminal 
program for Windows, but I'm not sure. Anyways, and then there are some other viruses here. I think X is uh, Windows. And instead, so they had like a CSV file and some information about that. And instead of putting that up as a CSV file, what they did is they, I mean, it's at least what I understood is they converted it to grayscale images using the intermediate net BPM text format. And then they created ASCII raw images and some did something else uh, to make it or to create JPEG files. So how it looks like is this one. So you can see basically these are yeah, JPEG images of these files. And this one would be, for example, the good one. And all the other ones are examples of malware. I haven't seen like an approach like this where people <laughs> yeah, kind of convert text. I mean, code is essentially text. Or here I think they used um, the checksums uh, of the files. But yeah, that was an interesting idea, like converting, let's say, text or a string into an image so that they can use convolutional networks. I'm actually not sure if that makes it better. So if you have a text file and, or some weird input format that doesn't look like a tabular data set, but also not like anything else. I'm not sure whether yeah, converting into a JPEG really is meaningful, but I thought that was interesting. They actually got pretty good performance or accuracies on that data set. So I think it's probably working. Yeah, I also saw this cool article this week called Simple Considerations for Simple People, <laughs> Building Fancy Neural Networks. So this is an article highlighting some of the things you should think about when building a model or also when debugging a model. And since you are now working on your class projects, I thought it was a nice summary really uh, that I wanted to share with you, like explaining, well, going over some tips in practice. So. The first step would be putting aside machine learning and simply focusing on your data. So before you start applying a model to your data, just take a look at your data and get a feeling for it. For example, looking at uh, whether the labels are balanced, like getting a feeling for that, uh, whether they're balanced or not, like on the same ratio for the class labels, same proportions. Um, so and are the gold labels that you, are there gold labels that you don't agree with? So gold labels here, they mean, um, ground truth. So are the test set or training set labels that are provided uh, making sense? Are there are some maybe that are wrong. Do you agree with them? Then also it's always useful to know how the data was obtained, whether, for example, there could be uh, possible sources of noise in this process. So I can tell you an anecdote. For example, there was for, I like it was like one or two years ago, there was a, a face image data set from IBM. I think it was called DI F or something like that. Um, it was uh, yeah a face data set shared by I IBM, and I applied to get access to this data set, and I was really excited to get it. But then uh, I wrote, uh, I read the README file, and was actually pretty disappointed because they shared a lot of yeah in attributes that can be used for developing machine learning systems, but then um, all these attributes were not uh, assigned by a human, like not labeled, they were actually predicted using another machine learning model. So if you develop a machine learning model based on labels predicted by another model, you would assume you can never actually do better than an existing model. And that I find not very useful for the development of machine learning methods necessarily. So in a way, it's also good to think a little bit about or find out how labels were obtained. And yeah, then also thinking about the pre-processing steps. Maybe there are some things that were not ideal. It's just good to yeah think about these, um, how diverse are the examples. And also what rule-based algorithm would perform decently on this problem. So like, can you think of a, a rule-based algorithm in terms of simple decisions that you might think of um, that can actually perform well? And then you can implement these simple rules as a baseline because you want to see that the model that you're training performs better than any simple baseline, for example. So for example, rule-based algorithm on uh, email spam data set could be if the subject um, header is capitalized in all caps, then it's spam, something like that, some, something simple maybe. Yeah, so while the previous slide focused on understanding the data set, so the second recommendation is about, yeah, understanding how difficult the task is. So how well 
would standard baselines perform on that task, for example, a classification task. So if you're working on a classification task, it's always a good idea to also include a simple baseline like logistic regression as a linear classifier. Because let's say you, uh, <laughs> suppose you develop a fancy neural network, let's say a convolutional network that gets 95% um, accuracy on MNIST. By itself, 95% might sound super impressive, but then let's say you run logistic regression, and usually if you do that on MNIST, you would see you will get around 93% performance already, or accuracy already. So 93% accuracy and 95% accuracy, that's not very different. So in that way, maybe the CNN is not as good as you might think. So having a baseline like logistic regression is actually a good idea, because maybe even you find if you train a... CNN or multilayer perceptron, it's like only 90%. And if you only know the number 90% accuracy and you tell someone I have a model that can predict, let's say, handwritten digits in MNIST with 90% and a person doesn't know MNIST, just looks at some examples, the person might be super impressed. But then uh, if you think about a logistic regression as a linear model already being able to do that, then it's actually not that impressive after all. Um, yeah, so <laughs> just going through these points here, how would a random predictor perform? especially in classification problems, and the data sets can be unbalanced. Um, I'm actually a little bit confused by this point. I think uh, the main point here is asking uh, how well a random predictor might perform. That is actually th something I also always ask myself. So if you have a binary classification problem, yeah, the uh, random prediction would be 50%, right? And for three classes, it's 33%. So it's always good to keep that in mind, um, what a random prediction might look like. Um, what I'm a little bit uh, confused about is this point if the data set is unbalanced. I mean, this shouldn't really affect the random predictor, right? So, because if you have, let's say, 90% spam and 20% not spam, and this is your data set, binary data set, the random predictor, predict, predictor would be 50% accurate, right? Because for each email, it would either randomly predict spam or not spam, so you get a 50% accuracy. And if the data set is balanced, it's also 50% for a random prediction. So it should always be 50% if you have a binary data set, or around 50%, let's say. I think what the person here was more interested in, in terms of um, data set can be unbalanced, is um, majority. class predictor because then it gets interesting for example on a balanced binary data set a majority class predictor would get 50% accuracy but if you have a data set like that where you have 80% spam and 20% not spam then some classifier that would always predict the majority class if the test set has these labels you would already get 80% accuracy just by always predicting spam so in that case, if you develop a machine learning system that gets, let's say, 82% accuracy, that's not very impressive because by always predicting the majority class, you can already get 80%. So that's actually also something worthwhile to think about when you develop a model. So then uh, the next thing is, what would the loss look like for a random predictor? So this is also yeah, related to... Uh, one of the quiz questions I had last week, re recall when I asked you to yeah, compute the cross entropy for the worst case scenario, which was um, yeah, infinity. But let's say if you have a case in, uh, where you always yeah, predict randomly. So a random classifier um, would have a loss of uh, one over the number of class labels, right? So this would be the maximum or the worst case. And if you don't have an infinity, in, uh, a zero in the lock, the totally random prediction would be, actually it should probably be, uh, let's say number of classes times minus lock um, one over the number of classes. So this would be a totally random prediction. I think it's um, for binary, it's around, oh, what would it be like two point three something, but I'm not sure I would have to double check. But it's always good to double check these numbers when you do training and you see the loss gets stuck at a certain point to see what would be the loss for a random prediction. And this way you can find out whether the model was learning something at all or not.
Yeah, some other points are what are the best metrics for measuring performance, for example, precision, recall, accuracy. Um, yeah, and also, yeah, the last one is also interesting. Uh, are there architectures in my neural network toolbox that would be good to model the inductive bias of the data? Inductive bias, we briefly talked about this. It's uh, like one of these machine learning jargon terms. For example, yeah, that, that goes actually back to the previous point, understanding the data set. So for instance, if you have time series data, it might be better to use a recurrent neural network. Or if you have image data, it might be good to use a convolutional network and so forth. So also, yeah, understanding your data set. Yeah, assume now you understand the data set and also the difficulty of the task. Uh, but you find that the model is not performing well. For example, um, the loss that you observed during training, the cross entropy loss, is the one that you would expect for a random prediction. So there might be something wrong with your code and um, that might be a good opportunity for doing some model debugging to see whether there is some error. So one common thing is usually if you have a learning rate that is way too large or way too small, then you will probably see that yeah, the model is not learning well. Um, if you personally, that's what I try first. If you tweak the learning rate though, but and you still find things are not performing well, what I also like to do is I try to overfit a small batch of examples. Um, that was actually really helpful in a recent research project where we had actually an issue where we used this technique to diagnose it. So when you only do training on a single mini batch, what you would expect is that the model should overfit to this mini batch and you should get like a small loss like around zero so how you can do that is just by adding when you do um in the data loader if you do like for uh let's say batch and labels in the um data loader when you do that and after the first um, training loop, I would add a break at the end. So in this way, you only do it once and then you do it for multiple epochs. And this way you can try to overfit to a single mini batch and you should get around zero loss. If not, there is something weird usually. So here are actually from that article, a few things to look into. For example, one could be you forgot to call model eval in the evaluation mode. We will talk more about this actually when we talk about dropout this week. But yeah, that would be one case or when you have, uh, well, you forgot model zero grad. So you will otherwise yeah, accumulate. If you, do, if you don't do that, you will accumulate the gradients from the previous rounds. And then if you update that, there uh, could also be some issues um, because you don't do gradient descent, you, you do something with accumulated gradients. Or there's maybe something wrong with the pre-processing of the inputs. Maybe you forgot to normalize them. Um, another common one is using the wrong arguments in the loss. So recall when we said that the cross entropy loss in PyTorch um, yeah, works with the logits. So if you um, provide it with the softmax probabilities, it will give you very uh, weird results. So that's also one thing to check for. Well, here initialization doesn't break symmetry. Um, that is related to the question I asked you when I said, why don't we uh, initialize all the weights in a neural network to zero? This is because we have symmetry. There was actually a nice Piazza post by one of the students who answered this question. So I recommend you to check out this post because yeah, it was very well written and it essentially explaining the problem very well. So there's actually a symmetry. If we initialize the network with all zeros or all small numbers that are the same. So what we want is we want to have small randomly different numbers to yeah, initialize the network to break the symmetry. Or here another one is some parameters are never called during the forward pass. So if you don't use them during the forward pass, they won't be updated because they are not part of the computation graph. Another one that happens often to me um, is if I have two models um, in, a simple, uh, in a single script actually happened to me when I was implementing this pipeline parallelism. So I had my Adam optimizer, or let's say, I think we, yeah, we haven't covered Adam. Let's say we had, I had my SGD optimizer. We will cover Adam later. And you pass it the model parameters like this. And I had two models in that uh, notebook. I had I just called it model, and the other one I called model parallel 
But when I was training the parallel model, I used still model parameters in the SGD. So it was not actually updating the right model parameters and then the training didn't work. And I was wondering, why is this model not training? And then I saw, oh, I, I didn't give it the right uh, parameters. Yeah, another one here is the learning rate is taking funky values like zero. So there's something called learning rate scheduler, which we will also talk about later. Uh, so lots of topics you notice that we will talk about later. But yeah, uh, deep learning is a big topic. There are lots of considerations in practice. And we can't cover everything in a single week, right? So we will cover all these things over the semester. But uh, we will come back to that. But there's a learning rate scheduler. And if you decrease the learning rate too fast, or too aggressively, you sometimes end up with a learning rate of zero very early on. And then yeah, your model is also not training or your inputs are truncated in a suboptimal way. What I find um, also useful in practice is also always to plot loss curves during training. So using the um, mini batch loss, for example, like this, uh, it's kind of efficient because you have to compute it anyway for the model update. And then, yeah, I usually plot it and see, you want to see that it goes down. I usually also do some running average because otherwise you can see it's very noisy and hard to see. So do, doing a run, uh, running average is also helpful. Uh, you have the code for that, right? So I shared that in last week's lecture. So I always recommend doing something like that. And uh, also what I like to do is after training, I like to visualize the training and validation accuracy. What I want to see is that um, yeah, it improves. You can see here at this point, there's maybe some overfitting starting. So this is actually the point where uh, yeah, the model performs really good. Um, so why is the training set performance worse than the validation? That is, can be just a random effect because the validation set was very small that I chose in this um, data set here. You can see it's all actually pretty good. But yeah, I always uh, like to look at these plots just to get a feeling of how the model behaves. All right, so last point, um, tune but don't tune blindly. So yeah, it's very tempting to just brute force set up a grid of hyperparameters to search over like brute force, um, trying out all possible hyperparameters. But this can be actually wasteful. And personally, I don't have the patience to do that. I usually, what I tweak extensively is the learning rate. I try different learning rates and then also other things, but usually the learning rate is very important. What other parameters, yeah, they can also be important, but usually I train or tune one parameter at a time to get a feeling for it. And then I try some combinations, but uh, not extensively. I think it would be good if I would try more of them, but I'm not a very patient person and uh, you can set it up to run it in the background. But even though, let's say you have access to a couple of GPUs, um, training a model can sometimes take half a day or a day. And instead of having like hundreds of parameter combinations that don't make sense, training and occupying your machine for several weeks, you can maybe just select a few of them and then get a feeling for them. And then you have a better feeling uh, what makes most sense in this given scenario, what modification would give you the best bang for the buck, for example. Here, this person also recommends um, random grid search. That's something we talked about in uh, five, um, 51 last semester briefly. So it's just, yeah, picking hyperparameter values randomly in a given range. That's also one uh, good approach, actually. Some people also like to use Bayesian optimization, but in my experience, also, also in his experience, uh, um, this is actually not, uh, yeah, usually worthwhile. All right, so now, yeah, there are four tips here. One is understanding the data set. The second was understanding like the baselines uh, and then the third one was um, model debugging tips and then here the fourth one yeah tuning is important but also don't do it blindly i mean you can but um usually yeah the, the limitation in practice is the computational resources if we, if we have infinite resources yeah then the tuning blindly would make sense but otherwise yeah we have to be resourceful and then it's good to tweak one thing at a time and understand what it does and then yeah consider tweaking other things all right the last thing for today i think it's already a long video um so the last thing for today i don't want to go into too much detail but uh, since i mentioned was it two weeks ago there's already a gan transformer uh, transformer gan uh, i also coincidentally saw now the second uh, transformer gan so it's called generative adversarial transformers and in this paper they call it the gans former 
I just want to share it because I found it's actually kind of cool, um, like seeing the field progressing so rapidly. In the last couple of years, we had transformers, we had GANs, and now, uh, while we are in this class, we saw that people developed now GANs with transformers, like uh, generative adversarial transformers. Might be something interesting you could try in your class project if you are considering GANs in your class project, that might be something. The code is on GitHub, so could maybe download it and play around with it, with it if you like. What I was impressive uh, is that the performance here is actually pretty good compared to GANs, and I can also see based on these images, they actually look quite good. So these are generated images. These are attention maps. I don't want to go into too much detail because, like I said, it's a long video. FID is the freshet inception distance, and this is something uh, that I will probably save for another day. All right, so, but in uh, general, I thought that might be interesting, something to have on your radar when you work on your class projects. Of course, it's all optional, so you don't have to consider this, but I just thought it's just, um, yeah, hot uh, off the press and it's something maybe cool to look into. All right, so with that, uh, next week we are going to cover regularization and uh, talking about different optimizers and learning rates and weight initialization. All right, so then see you next week.